No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Motherfucker! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. Hey, if you enjoy this show, why not support the Project Entertainment Network, especially because they're giving this to you for free? Best way to do that is to support them on Patreon. Just give them a dollar a month. And uh, you'll keep these good shows coming. You can do that at patron.com slash projectentnet. Or just Google Patron and Project Entertainment Network and you'll find it. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. With me, as always, Mr. and Mrs. Excitement, Dave Thomas and Mary San Giovanni. And this week's show is brought to you by Fell Beauties by Liam Shardlow. In the last outpost of ugliness in the world, beautiful people are falling from the sky. Well, that's already got you hooked, Dave, because I, that's like your fantasy, right? I, I seriously, I love the, the, the description of this book. I need to read this. <laughs> yeah. When Fat Janet is kicked out of the buffet where she is holed up for food and safety, she is forced to confront not only the reality of perfect falling bodies, but the attentions of an overzealous plastic surgeon and his followers. She teams up with a mystery man in hopes of getting out of this alive, but soon finds that confronting the problem head-on is the only option. Can imperfection survive this beautiful disaster? Fell Beauties by Liam Shardlow from the new Bizarro Author Series is available right now on Amazon.com. That's Fell Beauties. By Lee Am Shardlow. That's L E I G H A M S H A R D L O W. So uh, this kind of sounds like maybe a, a bizarro version of Kelly Sue DeConnick's Bitch Planet, at least thematically. I don't know because mm, Mary's maybe. never read Bitch Planet. Well, I she have doesn't, not. Yeah. I've only read a little bit of it, but yeah, I can see that. Yeah, comparison. I can see that too. Yeah, now I like I said, I, <clears throat> yeah, I read this ad copy. And I'm like, I need to read this. So, uh, <laughs> why well, I, I think yeah. Rose at Eraserhead Press, who listens to us every week, should send you a copy. Well, actually, he sent me a PDF of this. Oh, the okay. Author did. So okay. I just haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I I read this description. I'm like sold. I <laughs> this sounds delightful. This is <laughs> this is my sort of story right here. I was very excited. <laughs> Lombardo, again, you're not doing anything important. Look at this for your next movie. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All but, right. Uh, coming up in the show, Mary. If Edward Lee is the king of extreme horror, then who is the crown prince? Um, Raph? Eh, sorry, but thank you for playing. Dave, if Edward Lee is the king of extreme horror, then who is the crown prince? Uh, it would be Ryan Harding. That would be Ryan Harding. Yeah. Raph is a good, good choice. Yes. He's I like would, a duke, perhaps? I, I would say he's a duke or yes. the archduke. Which is higher, a duke or an archduke? I would say an archduke. Oh, archduke higher sounds duke. higher, yeah. Your Raph yeah. would be the archduke. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But but Ryan Harding. Realistically, Raph is going to be like whatever a... he wants to be because he's Raph and he can kill us all. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Ryan Harding, yeah. you know. He's an uh, overlord. <laughs> He, Ryan Harding is an overlord. He is, yeah. Uh, you know, grindcore musician, extreme horror writer, um, but and yet he's the boy next door. Mm -hmm. He's the all American boy he next is, door. Yes, he's very quiet. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna talk to him in the this second half. This is a great interview, show. by the way. I have to I have to comment, you guys. All the interviews you guys did at KillerCon are really good. Well, thanks. Uh, I have not yet finished listening to the Nate Southern one because uh, that one's really long. It's a hard one too. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but and also the technical quality of the recordings. is is excellent. I've had to do very little work on them. Oh, so very hey, this is you, you know, you know why that is? Because you don't have Kazanuki there picking shitty locations with recordings. <laughs> like, 
hey, here's the bathroom. Let's record next to that. Or, hey, here's the kitchen. This guy has a giant bin full of spoons, and he's going to continually drop them and pick them up throughout the interview. Let's record here. I mean, seriously, San Giovanni goes to a fucking Denny's in New Jersey, which you would think would just be nothing but mob rubouts all night long. And, like, the quality is great. She records it at Denny's table. You can hear the order waitresses taking for my moons over my hammy and all this shit. <laughs> Shit. So uh, yeah, so it was it was what uh, Kazanowski picked the locations for Grady Hendrix's yeah. appearance on the show and, and for Rose, and for Rose. And for Rose. And Rose two of the people appearance. we desperately wanted to have on the show. Yeah. yeah. So. Now the interview was really good because Mary was doing them. Well, I think but you. no, seriously, I just like to pick on Kazanowski because it's fun. It's not it's Jack really Herringa of yeah. the Shirley Jackson Awards. Yeah. He is adamant that if you and I now Jack seems oblivious to the fact that <laughs> last year. <laughs> Last year we had over four hundred thousand. Right. Yeah. Jack is still convinced there are six people listening to the harsh. Well, that's Jack. Yeah. But <laughs> and even after I showed him the numbers, yeah. he's like, eh, "Yeah, you guys could do better than that." <laughs> and and he's decided that 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 Mary should conduct all the interviews, and that you and I should be quiet. I guess you should engineer. And I don't. I don't know what I would. I guess I would read the ads. Read the ads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I disagree with Jack, but that's an unusual. You and, could do the news and the weather, baby. Yeah. I don't. But I don't want to do the news. Yeah. I'm so tired of of being the 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 Shepherd Smith to this fucking news show, to this fucking genre. Uh, especially one of today's stories just it, it enraged me, and then I started researching it, and it enraged me even more. And we'll get to that. Uh, but before we do. Um, I do want to remind folks, I guest starred on Mary's podcast, oh, that's Cosmic right. Shanigans. Yes. For part one of House on the Borderland. That's right. Um, it's, it ended up being your longest episode ever. Yeah. By yeah. far. Yeah. Yes. Most, of, most of your episodes are 20 minutes to a half They're an about hour. Tw- yeah. Yeah. We went over an hour. Yes. Um, because you made the mistake of having me on your show. But I like that. I like having different voices talking about Cosmic Horror periodically because- um, I think it keeps it new and interesting, and and as as just a, like a bystander to this because I don't participate in your show and record it. I thought it was fascinating, and I'm gonna wait till after part two, so I, I'm gonna go back because I've not read a House on the Borderlands since we did that William Pope Hodgen episode. And that was like two years. Yeah, ago that was two point. years ago. So I've not read it in a while. In fact, that episode yeah. played on Brian King did Radio it? last night at yeah. two o'clock in the morning, okay. and uh, I had a. a a uh, guy emailed me. He works at some factory in Illinois. Like, yeah, we're all listening to Brian Key Radio all that's night. Cool. So uh, no, I hope cool. they learn something. But, so about I'm Hawks. gonna I'm gonna go back and read the story. Out. But your your conversation about it was really interesting and made me think about some things that I had not thought about with the story before. So you guys did a really good job. Uh, I am no no way an expert on Hodgson. I've read that. The, what's the really weird thing? Is it the Nightland? The Nightland. The yeah. Nightland. Yeah. That's, I, that's I, unreadable. I was going to say, I've tried several times. I've tried again. We did the Hodgson episode. I'm like, this This is just not my thing. I can't get through no, this. I'm a, no, I'm yeah. a Hodgson devotee. Yeah, I know you're and, way more And I've it, yeah. never finished the Nightland. Yeah. It's it's unreadable. Yeah. Well, so that's the thing. I, I had it on my list to do for Cosmic Shenanigans, but then I don't think you hearing you guys talk about it, I went, well, maybe, yeah. maybe I'll just Kosinowski tried to read it. Because, right. you know, it, it, unlike... Uh, some yeah. new authors. Kosinowski actually fucking listens to me. I know, it's weird. Um, <laughs> and so he heard me talking about Hodgson, and, and he decided he would seek out some Hodgson. He made the mistake of, of reading The Nightland, though. Ah. And and then berated me. What what, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, well, so yeah, uh, Cosmic Shenanigans available wherever you listen to The Horror Show, and, and you can listen to the uh, the two-part House on the Borderland episode, and uh, it sounds a little more like the horror show than than Cosmic Shenanigans normally does. A I, little, but I don't think so. I think it's more, first. I of got all, in a Yoshi joke. How comes so, like when she's on that show, she's like Professor San Giovanni, like when she does <laughs> does Cosmic Shenanigans. Like she sits there, she makes no mistakes. She's like. St- it like comes off as like a totally different person. It just cracks well, me up. And that's who she really is. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying I, she's dumb I, or anything. I yeah. think. I think we dumb her down. I think we dumb her down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's um, around us for about half an hour, and then she's drooling. You know? <laughs> Although I did have a panic like moment those. next week, Dave. Of course, we are doing uh, our next book club selection, Nick Mamatas's "I Am Providence." Yes. And normally we record the show on Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. Mary will not be here next Wednesday. Oh wow! Well, and I had Wednesday. I had a panic attack because I, I, 
the last time you and I tried to do a book club by ourselves. Yeah, we got yelled at. Yeah, we got yelled at by yeah. our listeners. Yeah. So bring back the professor. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you guys are idiots. So we will have to record next Tuesday. Oh, that's fact. fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so let's go to the news. Uh, right. We have the bad news story and the good news story. Let's do the bad news story first. Get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Because then, right. then we can. Uh, cruise toward a happier note. And if there's a, a news story, there's a certain news story I have in my head. It's a good news story that if you don't bring it up, I am. So, well, if it's if, if it's about our our favorite filmmakers, yes, Justin it is. Benson and Aaron yes, Moorhead. Yes. Yeah, that's the good news okay, story. Okay, we'll talk week. about that later. Yes. So, all right. But yeah, now I know what the bad news story too. This is terrible. All right. Yeah, let's go with the bad news story. Another week, another asshole, and another name for the blacklist. Mm-hmm. Is this going to be another name also for the? Uh, uh, how many days since we've been sued last? Kind of oh, thing? oh, well, oh that reminds that. me. Yeah. That reminds me. We had to reset. Yes, yes we've the had to reset our, our lawsuit counter. We got a we got a, a threat last week. I believe that was the longest gap we've had. Forty two days 42 without days. threat yeah. of so a lawsuit. Well. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and this one is going to sue us for a million dollars. Uh huh. Because we have that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. And so yeah. does the project that are taking. Yeah. Hey, Armand, not Armand. our network, but yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure not Armand's million either. <laughs> um, so, so yes, we are, if we're counting when we record, it has been zero days. Yes. <laughs> since the of a loss. Yes, it's been updated. Um, but no, I don't think this one uh, will garner that. No, okay. I don't think so either. Um, so, yeah, another name for the blacklist. That name is Stephen. Marshall uh, and his publishing outfit, S-N-M. That's S as in snake, N as in nitwit, M as in muckface. S-N-M horror magazine. Um, Author Brett Graham got in touch with us, and he tells us, quote, Stephen Marshall used to be my editor. We even collaborated on a few books together. In 2014, we had a falling out. I haven't had any contact with him since that time fast forward now to 2018 and i'm browsing amazon and i come across a book called no clocks mirrors or windows by stephen marshall naturally i was curious so i clicked the look inside feature and what i saw were my stories stolen and published under his name end quote now i want to stop there okay um because you know our, our audience is made up not only of writers, screenwriters, directors, actors. It's also made up of fans and readers, okay? Right. Fans and readers, I, obviously, yes, this is plagiarism, but I want to make sure you understand what happened here, okay? Brett Graham wrote these stories, published these stories. Years later, he finds them in a book by Stephen Marshall with Stephen Marshall's name on them, as if Stephen Marshall has written them. In fact, Stephen Marshall did not write them. Brett Graham wrote them. Now, Brett goes on to say, quote, From what I've seen, only one of the stories in the book isn't mine, but it is stolen as well. It's called The Pen. It was written by Brian John Peer. It appeared in a 2010 anthology called Bonded by Blood 2, which is still available on Amazon to this day. Um, Brett then you know, because we do our due diligence here on the horror show. He provided me uh, with pictures, side by side comparisons. Um, you know, his stories were featured in his short story collection, Suspensia, which was published back in 2012. Okay. Mm-hmm. Stephen Marshall's uh, all appeared in No Clocks, Mirrors, or Windows. That was, of course, published this year, 2018. Um, so the horror show can indeed verify. Stephen Marshall stole these stories from Brett Graham. We can also confirm that he plagiarized Brian John Peer. Wow. Okay, so this is the the editor of what's it called SNM Horror Magazine. Um, he has published an entire short story collection of stolen short stories by Brett Graham and Brian John Peer. Wow. Now, I followed up with Brett, and I learned more. He says, quote, The majority of the stolen stories, as he said, came from Suspensia, his short story collection. Stephen Marshall was the editor for that project and had access to all the interior files. Um, 
his short story, Dr. Spindle's House, which is featured in Suspensia, was also published earlier in Bonded by Blood 2. That was also edited by Stephen Marshall. So, Brian John Pierce's story, also edited by Stephen Marshall. That's how Marshall got the access to these. Uh, Brett goes on to tell us he has contacted Amazon about this. He emailed them as evidence, ISBN numbers, and a statement that he is the copyright owner. So far, Amazon has not taken action. Uh, now, the horror show reached out to Marshall. Right. His side of the story, as we always do, he did not respond. Maybe he'll respond three years from now. I don't know. <laughs> um, but he, he did he did not respond. Uh, however, uh, we have seen evidence of a Facebook posting that he made in which he claims that he owns the copyright because he published them. And that, therefore, he can then publish them as his what? own stories, which is is ludicrous to the point of insanity. Yeah. That's not how copyright law works no. in America, in England, in Botswana, I don't give, on Mars. I don't give a fuck where you are. That's, that's not, not how any of this works. That's not how this works. No. That's not how any of this works. No. Wow. Okay, so that alone is bad enough, right? That's bad. But wait, there's more. Oh, good. <laughs> that's the horror bad. show can confirm that this is not, not the first time Stephen Marshall and SNM Horror Magazine has been accused of plagiarism. The editor of abctales.com posted publicly back in 2012, quote, Stephen Marshall from SNM Horror Magazine submitted two stories to me for publication consideration into this book anthology I was editing. I accepted one called Halloween in Heaven. This was back in 2010. Okay, so she's writing this in 2012. The incident she's talking about happened in 2010. 2010. She goes on to allege that the story was stolen from an author named Brendan Moody and that there was a fourth author who she didn't name. Fourth, I'm saying here, okay, we've got we've got Brett. Right. We've got Brian. Now we have this Brendan Moody. Okay. And right. then she intimates there's a fourth author that has also accused Marshall of plagiarism as well. So that's four cases of this. And this is going all the way back to 2010. So here we are eight years later. She made a public post about this, but apparently we need some kind of, of, if only there was a news source, if only there was a place people could tune in and listen to every week. And this is why I'm stuck doing the goddamn news every week. <laughs> well, Edward Lauren's doing videos now. Maybe Edward will, will stick up and, and ca carry the sword. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But anyway, pretty bad, right? That's, yeah, that's mm. very bad. Mm. That's like the, the worst thing you can do to a writer. One of the worst things. You can do. <laughs> but there are worse things that you can do to a human being, and Stephen Marshall has done that as well. Uh, plagiarism, as it turns out, isn't the worst crime Marshall is alleged to have committed. Oh, good Lord. The Horror Show can confirm that in 2014, Stephen Marshall of SNM Horror Magazine was arrested on accusations that he sexually abused a seven-year-old girl. Oh According to an arrest report, Ugh. Stephen G. Marshall, aged 44, of Florida, was found by the girl's father leaving her bedroom while adjusting his pants. The girl reported to her father that Marshall had abused her. Marshall was taken to jail on charges of sexual battery on a child under 12 and lewd and lascivious molestation. Uh, the horror show has viewed his mugshot. We have viewed the arrest report. We have viewed all the documents. Again, we can confirm this Stephen G. Marshall of Florida is, in fact, Stephen Marshall of SNM Horror Magazine. Oh, my God. You know, if he was, con now, if he was convicted um, on that charge of sexual battery under a child under 12, do you know he could lose his ham radio license, of which his call sign is KC4CUS? 
That's KC4CUS. Dave, does that count as doxing if I give out someone's ham radio call sign? No, I don't think so. That's, that's <laughs> does, a... does anybody even listen to ham radio My anymore? My dad was a ham radio. Your dad right? was a ham radio. I mean, yeah. That sounds like yeah. it should be the first many, line of a story. My dad was a ham radio. I, I, I was a ham. I was a ham. I, was say, I thought you had a. I, thought I, you had a license, I still have yeah. a license. Yeah. Um, in fact, I have my grandpa's old license. Oh, wow, there. really? Yeah. yeah. You need a license? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. You have to take tests and stuff? Yeah. Coop has a license. Yeah. Because he, needs it, used to do it. Yeah. he needs it for his model rockets. Yeah. Um, huh. But I don't know anybody. Well, that's that's an untapped market, I think. Instead of social media and podcasts, yeah. we, we should start a ham radio show. <laughs> we just broadcast <laughs> the podcast on ham radio. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so, I, you know, I don't know if... Uh, if that's to dox somebody to give out their, I don't, their no, ham radio. A, but I not. do know that if you've ever been convicted of a felony by any state or federal court, you cannot have a ham radio license. So maybe, maybe if we do have ham enthusiasts listening to this show, maybe you contact the FCC and tell them that KC4CUS has this in his background. I don't know. Uh, again, I, I want to reiterate, we did, in fact, reach out to Marshall. Mm-hmm. We received no response. Um, I'm not sure what kind of response he could give us, but you know, I, I mean, the, the the proof is there. The the proof is there. We've all seen it. Um, it's it's clear cut case of theft and plagiarism. Um, if you're currently being published by Stephen Marshall, SNM Horror Magazine, get out while you can. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're still working from him a year from now. That's on you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely putting him on the blacklist. Oh, definitely. Wow. So congratulations to him for that. And uh, now I have a question. I have an answer. Okay. Probably do. Because um, I'm not a publisher or anything. I don't know how this works. So this book is on Amazon, correct? Right. Doesn't Amazon is how, is, let's say this happened to not you guys, because like if it happened to you, you'd just have him murdered. So no, I'm joking about that. Maybe. Or is <laughs> or am I? Yeah. But, what is it? What is it? Eminem <laughs> says, "I've got enough money to have you killed by somebody who has nothing." I, in fact, yeah. don't have enough money to do that. Right. So I'll just kill you myself. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, my, seriously, the question is: let's Say this happens to you, and when I say you, I mean like people listening to the show. There's tons of writers who listen to the show. So say they discover their work has been plagiarized on Amazon. Is there any recourse through Amazon to get this taken off there Amazon? There is. Um, I had this happen to me once, and. It took, I guess the process was about six days. It's, you got, you have to fill out, you know, uh, a notice Mm -hmm. of copyright infringement. Amazon does not make that easy to find. Uh, It's, it's there in the terms and conditions. Basically, if you go to the book and you scroll down to, uh, I think, report an issue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get the drop down box and Mm -hmm. it's report copyright infringement. Okay. Okay. First of all, you have to be the copyright holder. Right. Like, if Mary's book was stolen, I couldn't report it. No, you it can't for report it. The, okay, so the writer um, has to report it. Right. Okay. You click on that, and then it gives you this big, long terms and conditions things. But if you scroll down to notice of copyright infringement, it gives you the link to mm-hmm. a form right there. You fill that out. It took me about six days for them. But as we've talked about on shows before, I'm aware, in fact, being in a relationship with and living with another writer, I'm aware that I've got some privilege with Amazon that other authors may not necessarily have. Understood. Um, so my experience may have been much faster than someone else's. Um, you know, I if Brett would like my help, I'm certainly willing to step up and, and talk to Amazon on his behalf. But Amazon will not take it down without Brett say so and as he says well, here he has contacted Amazon I mean that makes um, sense because then people could just all day claim copyright claims against people they don't like so right. I understand but, yeah, basically, but there is a process yeah you've got to you've got to fill out that okay. digital okay. Uh, millennial copyright because act. this isn't the first time I've heard a story like this uh and I was just thinking there's got to be a way to do this but well, and the is, problem is, is there another way that here's the other thing because he didn't discover this until he just accidentally stumbled upon exactly it. so I, I know there's all these like various websites and things out there is there like i was i'm surprised actually that amazon does an algorithm or ai that looks at text to try and see if anything's you know copied from somewhere else or something i don't know yeah i mean i I, that actually surprises me that they're not doing that because in a case like this nobody has any money but at some point somebody might rip off somebody who has money you know, or a big publishing house, and they might take Amazon to court over it. You well, know? So it's you think like they want to uh, be on top of this. It's like, it's like that guy that publishes 
horror novels under the name Stephen King spells it the same way, and it ain't Steve. But Amazon's never removed him. But is he um, stealing Stephen King's work? Or is he writing his own stuff? It's it's blatant that he's no, he's not plagiarizing. But mm. it, what he what he's doing is 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 in fact fraud. Um, you know, he'll he'll even title his shit the same in some huh. cases because you can't copyright. No, you can't copyright a title. I know you know, that. Amazon doesn't step in for that. Um, digital the a DCMA mm. or DMCA, right? They have to. Um, by law, they're required right. to. You know, but the process is slow because Amazon is this giant fucking corporation. I'm not slagging on Amazon. No, it's just but there any giant know, corporation is going to be a slow process. That's unfortunately just yeah, the way it is. Um, um, so, and the the problem is because Marshall self published this collection, mm-hmm. an author like Brett, he has to file out file a DMCA notice with Amazon. If Marshall put it on Nook, then he's got to file one with Barnes & Noble. Right. If he put it on Kobo, he's got to file one with Kobo. If he put it on Smashwords, it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah. it, it's it's a pain in the ass. And you go to try to sue Marshall, the guy probably has no money. I was going to say, he yeah, probably has um, no money. You know, I, I, while we were researching this story, I did come across his financials, publicly available information. Yeah. Um, you know, it, Brett's not going to recoup anything. So it's... It's a mess. Um, uh, it's an absolute disaster. I, I don't think, I mean, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, unfortunately, I don't think there's any way that you can protect yourself from this happening. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. You know, it's it's just like ebook piracy. You, right. you can't protect yourself can't from that either. Protecting. It's yeah. just, it's something you have to deal with as a writer sooner yeah. or later, probably. You know? I mean, I think this is important information to get out there, both in this case, because nobody should be talking to this guy, letting him work with him. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, also just for, I know there's a ton of people listening to the show that are writers and um, they're not all, they're all at all different levels of success, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's another thing to be aware of. You know? Exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the fun never ends here. Um, <laughs> I just, every time, like you said, the story's bad enough and then it gets worse. And it's just like, uh, I just, uh, I know. I just, can't we just like talk about TV shows? <laughs> we can, but I there's know. nothing good on TV right now except uh, Better Call Saul. Uh, um, Better Call Saul is Better good. Call Saul. This no. season is ama- This season is a work of art. Well, I, that's funny because first of all, I don't judge a show until it's done for the season, but I do feel there is something, and I can't talk about it on the air because it's a huge spoiler if you've not been watching the show. There's something missing from this season. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, one I, of the characters, you yes. mean? Yes. Well, I think I. Just, I need to see the whole season. I will say I like the last two episodes. I watched the last two yesterday. A lot more than some of the stuff previous to it. Uh, Gus's speech in the host, in the hospital yes. was one of the best moments ever of the show. Oh, and yes. And the opening montage of Kim and, and Saul. Oh, with the time jump. With the time yeah. jump. Yeah. That was so, well, that was one of the best sequences on any TV show ever. The way that was shot and edited and the music, that was brilliant. But I do think that there's a certain aspect of the show it's not as good without this person you talking about nacho <laughs> yes no i'm not well because no, yeah. no you're not talking about no, nacho no 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 oh okay yeah. well yeah i know yeah. who you're talking about yeah. yeah you don't want to spoil it because no. i don't think that season's on netflix it's not that's what i'm trying um, to be careful about okay. what i'm talking about yeah. something happens in, in last season that affects this season and it, just for me because i've made comments about that particular aspect of the show before it might be a personal thing uh, but I th- I feel it's missing a little bit. Like I said, the last two episodes I thought were really really good. I'm not ready to say it's better than Breaking Bad yet because the show isn't over. Because mm. a lot of shows start out great. Perfect example: Sons of Anarchy. When that started, that show was fucking amazing, and it went into the toilet. Have you watched uh, the? I've not watched mine yet. I have it. I have to talk about this too. Um, and here, this isn't bad news. This is interesting because we're always having this discussion about cable TV, not cable TV, because you have a Roku, and you know, cable or right. high cable. We ditched cable, finally. Um, we have Verizon FiOS. Uh, TV is our major form of entertainment, but it's crazy expensive. And, you know, we tried to work with them on a deal, and they wanted to charge us more money, and they thought that was a deal. And I'm like, really? Okay. Um, and the hard, the bad part of it is part of it, a lot of our bill was equipment rental because you're not allowed to buy your own cable boxes and DVRs, which if you could do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you can buy your own cable modem. I, I did that years ago because they want to charge your rental fee. No, I just right. bought my own. You're allowed to do that. You're not allowed to buy cable boxes and DVRs, which is unfortunate because you could save a ton of money. So we ditched cable. We have our Roku. We kept the internet, obviously. 
So we still well, yeah, you gotta have you gotta have internet. Roku to work. Well, but you have the internet in general because you know I'm using it all day long. But uh, <laughs> and cat videos. <laughs> well, yeah, well, so but we we like TV. There's stuff we like to watch on TV, and I enjoy sports. I know you guys don't watch sports. I love football. So sports. I did all this research on these various services. There's Sling. There's there's live TV through Hulu and stuff. We ended up with the PlayStation View service. Right. Mm-hmm. I have to say, for the most part, we really like it. The reason I picked that one. Uh, far and away it was the pitcher quality. The pitcher quality on is fabulous. Uh, like Sling would probably have been a better deal cost wise, but they only broadcast at thirty frames a second, and I know this wouldn't annoy me. So <laughs> I went with the a little bit more expensive. It's fifty bucks a month, but I get all my sports, uh, with the exception of Orioles baseball games. That's the one thing I, you cannot get with a cable TV package. But they're so terrible, I gave up on them. So <laughs> um, I'll just go to games occasionally because I don't live far from the stadium. But we've had this for about a month. We really like it. The only thing I don't like about it is it's a cloud DVR, which basically means it's not a real DVR. You're not recording it yourself. It's just like a pointer to a hard drive somewhere out in the internet land. Yeah. Um, the controls aren't the best. For example, I like sports, so I want to watch football. Well, if I tell it to record football, then it, quote unquote, records all football games. Like everyone is available on all the channels. So you kind of have to scroll through a big list of games to find the one you want to watch. See, we just we yeah. see now you can't get sports on Fandango, but I was gonna no. say we we just use uh the Fandango app right. on Roku and then it it's like a DVR. Sure. You watch the you show watch whenever the show you're ready you to watch it. Yeah, this is this you is know? like you get live T V, we get our local stations. Um it gets for Phoebe, the Hallmark Channel, so she can watch her terrible movies. <laughs> um, it, ha- it has a decent channel selection because, like I said, we enjoy watching television. Um, so the cloud DVR thing's got a little wonky, but we're getting used to it. And the on demand's kind of the same way, and you have to use the search to figure out if you can actually get to the show on on demand. Everyone says use the interface on the PlayStation because the interface on the Roku is terrible, which I've noticed in general. Roku interfaces are awful. Like, if you look at the ones on an Apple TV versus the Roku, the Roku ones look like it was kids in a kindergarten class. Like, Jason V. Brock designed the interfaces. That's what they look like. <laughs> like, they're terrible. So, but in general, I, I'm we're really impressed with this. I really like it. It's, it's way cheaper than cable. Uh, we're saving well over $100 a month with this setup. Uh, so, I, again, I, I encourage people, look into it. Uh, and probably the other thing we're going to do is after football season's over, I'm going to drop back to the cheaper package without all the sports channels because I don't watch sports when football's not on. So I'll, it'll be like $30 a month or something. Nice. Uh, the only thing is that next year we'll put HBO back on when the Game of Thrones starts again. Yeah. Because right now there's nothing on HBO we want to watch. But we can get that through there. We can get it through Amazon. So that's not a problem. So pretty much anything we want to watch other than Orioles baseball games are available online through one of these services. You know what else is available on those services? Uh, the Horror Show with Brian Keene. <laughs> the Horror Show with Brian Keene. Yeah, yeah. but The Endless spring oh, resolution yes. by yes. by our, our friends Justin Benson and Aaron Woo-hoo! Moorhead. Yeah. Um, and that brings us to our good news story of the week. And then we'll get to our interview with Ryan Harding. Deadline has the exclusive. I don't know why Deadline has the Yeah, exclusive. I don't know why either. Justin, you follow me on Twitter. You yeah. couldn't send me a DM. They say, follow hey, me on Twitter, yeah. Hey, Brian, Dave, Professor San Giovanni. Here, <laughs> here's a little exclusive for the horror show. Yes, Deadline reports that Captain America Civil War star Anthony Mackie and a private war star Jamie Dornan uh, are in talks to appear in Synchronic, the new movie from Justin and Aaron. Uh, as I said, this will be their fourth film following Resolution, Spring, and the Endless. Uh, the movie, what we know about it is that it is about two New Orleans paramedics. So Coop might watch yeah. it. We might be able to get Coop to it's watch a, a movie. movie about yeah. Coop. Yeah. What's two... <laughs> What? What's that movie you could, the last movie you saw that you guys went to see? And he... The last movie I saw with Coop. Yeah. This is when we were both still married and our, our wives were best friends. Uh, and so we, you know, Coop. I love this story. Coop is not the most romantic sort. <laughs> no. What? And <laughs> Horror show exclusive. I, <laughs> I said, you know, we should take the girls out on a double date. And Coop's response was, why the fuck would we do that? <laughs> And I said, because girls general, in general like it when you do that sort of thing, Coop. Um, <laughs> occasionally look across the room and, and lean over and say, you know what? I love you. They, they seem to respond to this. So we end up going on a double date. And we went to see 28 Days Later. Oh, that's what it was. I couldn't remember. Now, that movie. movie came out, I don't know when. But this like, was the well last time Coop went to movie theater. We, yeah. we go to see 28 Days Later. And... Uh, Coop was a smoker at the time, so he's nicking and he's doing the the leg the thing, leg, leg jittering up and yeah. down. And uh, 
you know, I I immediately fall in love with Twenty Eight Days Later. I I just think it's fucking brilliant. Uh, Coop gets up and he says, "This is Simon Clark's blood crazy. I'm going out for a smoke." And he leaves the theater. And he's right. There were some elements sure. of Simon Clark's blood crazy. Oh, there sure. were some elements of it's my own the rising. Yeah, absolutely. But it was zeitgeist. It's not yeah. like they ripped us off. This shit was it all out came there in the other same yeah. time. Yeah. So he, you know, he goes out to smoke. Um. Well, then, then his wife says, uh, I'm, I'm going to go check on Coop. And she goes. And she leaves. This is like 20 minutes into the movie, mind you. Well, then my wife says, I, I need a cigarette, too. And she goes. And none of them came back. I watched the rest of the film by myself. <laughs> and I loved it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and I left. I left. Like, it did cross my mind, huh, none of them have come back. Should I go check on them? No, fuck that. I'm going to watch the movie. <laughs> so I, then I left when the film was over, and, and Coop berated me the whole way home. How dare I make him go to the movies? And, yeah, that was the last time we yeah. ever did a double date, yeah. <laughs> and that was the last time Coop had been to the movies. The time before that, he went with Rain Graves, author Rain Graves. Mm-hmm. They went to see uh, M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense. Okay. And... About 20 minutes into the movie, Coop stood up and told Rainey and told the rest of the audience, keep in mind, he's never seen the film, right. but 20 minutes in, he stands up and says, the kid's a ghost, or excuse me, he stands up and he, he says, Bruce Willis is a ghost, I'm going out to smoke, and he never came back in. So this is a pattern. This is a pattern. Okay. <laughs> this would be a good movie review on, show on TV, where you send Coop to the movies about 20 minutes in, and he tells you what's going to happen, he leaves. He saves you a lot of time. Yeah, so... And he's, he's smoking for half There's his spinoff podcast yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, the movie is about two New Orleans paramedics whose lives are ripped apart after encountering a series of horrific deaths linked to a, des- a designer drug with bizarre, otherworldly effects. Yay! Um, the film is produced by David Lawson Jr. Uh, that's the guy who also produced The Endless, uh, along with Justin and Aaron themselves. Uh, the script was written by Justin. XYZ Films is handling international sales, uh, and domestic rights, I believe, went to UTA Independent Film Group. So congratulations yes, to them. Nice. Just, I can't wait for this. I'm, I'm excited for a couple reasons. First of all, it's another movie for these guys. Uh, number two, it's New Orleans, so it's a totally different location than their other three films, mm-hmm. you know, which I think will be an interesting character in and of itself. Because if like spring, you know, Italy is kind of like a character in the film. Right, right. You know, so I think New Orleans would be really cool. Uh, they've got some bigger name actors this time. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking they might have a, a decent-sized budget to work with. And I'm hoping... For a theatrical release, so I can see one of the movies in a theater, which I've never done yet. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, because I tried, I just never got a chance to catch Endless on the film festival circuit. So I'm really hoping this time we get even a limited release would be cool, just to be able to see it in a big screen. I can't can't remember who I was talking. I think it was Keelan Patrick Burke, but I might be wrong. We were talking about how how these guys, they really sort of transcend genre. Oh yeah. Like I mean, their stuff's being marketed as horror, but it's not really horror. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's beyond other horror. Yeah. Um. I would what I what I desperately wish for these guys is that they just be known as Benson and Moorhead. Mm-hmm. It's a Benson and Moorhead joint, you know, like right. Spike Lee. It's exactly. a Spike Lee joint. It's yeah. a David Lynch film. Mm-hmm. Cohen Brothers. Yeah, yeah, the Cohen Brothers. The Cohen That's Brothers. A great example. example. Yeah, great example. A Benson and Moorhead production. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, this is going to be a film I want to see. No matter, you know, right. it, it could be. A remake of Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, but if it's Benson and Moorhead, yes, I will give it a chance. I will check it out. Um, Don't n- give n- anybody see, any ideas. See, now I want to see Justin and Aaron remake Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. Well, you're stuck in a time loop, and you have to just watch that movie over and over again. That's, Herbie, yeah. Herbie the Love Bug crashing into a wall over, over, and, over and over and over again. <laughs> Is okay. this one going to be connected to the other? I don't know. I, it's unknown. I. And I might be wrong about this, and please correct me if I am. I could swear in an interview that he said the next thing they were going to make was kind of tied into it. Okay. They're loosely tied together. But, again, that could have been a totally different idea because that interview – I think the interview I read was like when the, the movie first started at Film Festival Circuit. That interview is well over a year old at this point. Right. So who knows? Like I, Honestly, though, I, what I like about their movies is I never really know anything about them before I see them. Yeah. Like, I'll yeah. just know the basic premise. Like. Two guys go back to a, a cult that they used to be in. That's all I knew about that movie. And then, you know, you, you see it. And you're, I kind of like that. I hate movie trailers. 
you know, because they ruined the movie. I try not to watch them. Mm-hmm. Although anybody who saw the trailer for the new Predator movie and thought that it was going to be good is an idiot because <laughs> that trailer fucking sucked. And now everybody's like, this movie's terrible. Skip really? the movie, read Mark Morris's novelization of the screenplay. Really? Yeah. Is that good? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. yeah. Cool. Yeah, you know, I, I did not know he did that. That's well, yeah, because cool. Mark wrote it. Oh, okay. He, he took a shit screenplay and actually into, made it readable. Into, yeah, I'm going to check that out. I mean, I like Predator. I like the concept of it. But after the first two, like, really? Like, I still don't understand how you screw up Aliens versus Predator. Like, how do you screw up that idea? Like, right? You, it's like the easiest right. movie in the world to make. That's you have like Aliens, King you have Predator. Versus Godzilla. They fight for an hour and a half. What more do you need? Right. Like, and they totally ruined it. <laughs> that still makes me mad. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like one of those ideas. Is like, I mean, the comic book is you know a really good idea. It's like this is a genius idea. How hard is this to do? It's kind of like Transformers again. Another one. Robots, giant robots kicking the crap out of each other for two hours. The, right. the script we, writes you know, itself. You, you, know? Don't, you don't need much more than no, that. No, really. I'm entertained. You know, quit screwing around trying to make it funny. No, it's not funny. Well, it's funny in a way, but you know what I mean. Uh, but that's just that's my my movie commentary there. Um, <laughs> speaking of TV shows you're watching again, I have to recommend the TV show The Sinner. Uh, final episode of it is uh, well, it's actually on last night as you hear this. It was on Wednesday night, but uh, season one's on Netflix. Season two is on USA. Just watch it. Season one is still one of the best things I've ever seen on television. Yeah. Season two, not quite as good, only because since it's season two, you kind of already know it's a murder mystery, but there's more to the story than, right. than initially to it. Like the first time you're watching, you have no idea what's going to happen. This time you kind of know. The only repeating character is the police detective from the first show. Gotcha. The first season. The second season is all different characters except him, which I think is a good idea. It's kind of like a true detective thing, but there's like mm. just one recurring character. But I'm imploring you, especially if you're a horror fan, if nothing else, watch season one on Netflix. Uh, it's not marketed as a horror story, but it is totally a horror story. Absolutely. Nice. And the second season is kind of involving a religious cult. Uh, so it's. I again, do like me some cults. Yeah, you no, are- you'll like this. I When I've been watching it, I'm like, Mary really needs to watch this. But yeah, I do think both of you guys would enjoy it, but definitely should, check it I out. I should clarify that that Predator novelization is not just Mark Morris, it's oh. Mark Morris and Christopher Golden. Oh. Well, uh, even better. My co-host on Defenders yeah, Dialogue. Well, no, that's that's so. I did not know they did that. So I Chris would has check it out. some news that oh, yes. we can't talk oh. about on Defenders Dialogue, and we can't talk about it on this show, and I want to talk about it so bad. And I Chris, know I know you're listening. If you don't give me the exclusive to talk do, 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 about do, 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 do. it before anyone else, I will cry. Oh, don't cry. So anyway, yes, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, to Justin and Aaron. Can't wait. I Yay. can't wait to see this. I'm so excited. Yeah, and they need to be guests on the show. We need, you know, th- we definitely need to have them on the show. Yeah. They are guests that I would be willing to travel. Oh, absolutely. Like, I'd be willing to fly out to L.A. if they'll yeah. concede to give us an hour. Uh, in a no, in a second, I'd go. Yeah. I have many questions for them. <laughs> They're going to answer. I do, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, one more time before we get to our interview with Ryan Harding, I want to remind you that this week's show is brought to you by Fell Beauties. That's the new novel from Liam Shardlow in the last outpost of ugliness in the world. Beautiful people are falling from the sky. When Fat Janet is kicked out of the buffet where she is holed up for food and for safety, she is forced to confront not only the reality of perfect falling bodies, but the attentions of an overzealous plastic surgeon and his followers. She teams up with a mystery man in hopes of getting out of this alive, but soon finds that confronting the problem head-on is the only option can imperfection survive this beautiful disaster? Fell Beauties by Liam Shardlow from the new Bizarro author series available right now in Kindle and in paperback on Amazon.com. All right, let's go to this interview with Ryan Harding, and then we'll be back on the flip side. Okay, Mary. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited. Uh, joining us now is the author of Genital Grinder and the collaborations Reincarnage, done with uh, Jason Taverner, 1,000 Severed Dicks with Matt Shaw, uh, Partners in Kime, and of course Header 3, both with Edward Lee, and uh, a much-rumored forthcoming novel with Brian Smith. His short fiction has appeared in Year's Best Hardcore Horror Number 3, Into Pain Freak, Masters of Horror, The Magazine of Bizarro Fiction, Excitable Boys, In Layman's Terms, DOA 3, and... The Collectible, A Darker Dawning 1 and 2. How could I not be excited about uh, He is an accomplished magi- musician, uh, serving as a bassist and a vocalist in several metal grindcore bands. I am, of course, talking about Ryan Harding. Welcome Woo-hoo! to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's 
awesome to finally be here to do this. It's awesome to finally have you, buddy. We were going to do this two years ago when I was uh, on the end of the road tour. I was going to spend the night at your house, right. and we were going to get drunk and do your mother, <laughs> and then we were going to do this. And, and, and I should warn new listeners, Ryan and I have had a thing about each other's mothers going on 20 years now, <laughs> so you will get much of that. But yeah, we were. my Jeep blew up on me. The radiator blew out. We didn't get a chance to do it. So I have saved these questions for two years, but then I've also updated them as well as time Good. has gone by. So uh, you would have been the second keen to stay overnight in my my apartment. So <laughs> you actually put my mom up? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. There's an elaborate pulley system. So <laughs> I'm gonna tell your father. <laughs> oh, he knows. <laughs> So what came first for you, man? The desire to be a musician or the desire to be a writer or to be a serial killer? (laughs) What was it first? Well, there was a lot of bedwetting, so maybe serial killer? (laughs) No. Uh, Definitely writing. Um, I saw Friday the 13th Part 7 at an impressionable age. How old do you remember? I I was uh, in fifth grade, whatever age you are then. uh, About 10 or 11 years old. Okay. And I saw that, and I was just... uh, and transfer the idea of writing those kinds of stories and that I could do it right then and there. So I just got started doing it. So you started then? Yes, it was just fan fiction. It was, you know, writing about Jason and <laughs> a lot of other uh, horror icons. And a lot of cases that I hadn't even seen at that point, but just putting them in stories and, you know, they were slaughtering classmates, that, that, kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing. Do you look back on that now and think, wow, if I was a kid doing that today, I'd be in all kinds of trouble? Yeah. Because I mean, I used to do the same thing. I, I, in fact, I've still got an old manuscript at home where I kill off several classmates. <laughs> you know. Yeah, very much, very much so. It, it would have been problematic. I usually brought them all back at the end. At that age, I didn't think I understood that in movies they stayed dead normally. Yeah. <laughs> Unless they were the killer. So but. were you were you reading horror fiction as well or was it mostly movies for you at that point it was movies uh later that year i got started reading the books and it was friday the 13th novelizations by simon hawk right and i remember uh i was sharing one of those books with a kid beside me and he looked through it and like raised his hand he's like ryan's reading a book where people make love and get killed <laughs> <laughs> really said that make love fifth grader what, what the teacher oh. said <laughs> nothing came of it fortunately no so i was enabled even back then i know when you were in high school you discovered sort of the true crime genre and you were reading a lot of stuff about serial killers and stuff like that did you start incorporating that into your fiction then or had you stopped writing by that point uh it did but it yeah it probably informed what i was doing i was writing more and more just graphic stuff by then yeah yeah mary because we've talked on the show you know you read a lot of the true crime and serial killer stuff as well you still do yes i mean you're a serial killer junkie was that about (laughs) that's a way to put it was that about the age you discovered it too Um, like high school yeah i'd say yeah i'd say probably high school because prior to that um I don't know that I actually knew that real people did that until, yeah, probably until like middle school, high school. So, yeah. so you're doing all this. You're not. You didn't become a serial killer because you found a healthy outlet for your rage. <laughs> but you know, I remember. You know, we've talked on the show before about the early days. You know, '97, '98. Um, you know, when it's it's. Levin and J.F. Gonzalez, Jeff Cooper, Mikey Hike, Mike Oliveri, Gina Mitchell, you, me, John Urbansick, all of us hanging out in the old horror net forum and chat room. And, you know, we're in there with Richard Lehman, Edward Lee, Ray Garten, John Peelan. How old were you at that time? By that time, I was out of high school. I was in college, so I was at like 18 or 19 years old. But you were the baby of the group. I then. was, yeah. <laughs> it's Gina, you're hanging out in the background. How old were you at the time? I must have been 23, 24. 23, 24, and I was in my early 30s. So you're 18, 19. Did you know who Layman and Lee and those guys, had you read those guys yet, or were they just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, before uh, horror in that chat room, I'd already established contact with Lee through email. Right. I'd 
posted, I guess, a defense of one of his stories because I think somebody on the message board said, you know, they didn't care for it, and I said that I did. And um, I guess he emailed me and, you know, thanked me for the support, and that just, you know. How did you first find his work? Probably, I think I just found it in used bookstores. Yeah. You know, at, the, at that time, I still read various things by Zebra. Right. And so it was like Nightbait or Creakers or one of those? It was, pro- it was probably uh, Creakers or The Coven. Yeah. One of those. And um wasn't long after that that his uh, stuff like Header started coming out. Right. Or was available, I mean, and I started buying that and seeing the more extreme stuff that he'd been doing. So what that's what's that like for you? You're an 18 year old kid from the south, you know, relatively small town. Mm-hmm. Now you're exchanging emails with Edward Lee. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. It's awesome, you know, it was great. I mean, just to have that immediate contact with somebody because of the internet was, you know, just right. An amazing thing. And, uh, and not long after that, you guys, you end up collaborating together. Uh, you, you did Partners in Kime. Um, how did that come about? Did you approach him? Did he say, hey, kid, you want to write something with me? I mean, what it was, uh, I read the, my story in uh, Partners in Kime was Damaged Goods, which is in Genital Grinder. Right. Which was highly influenced by his Dicky and Balls characters from The Big Head. Right. And, um, I'm sorry, it just makes me giggle. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is funny. But uh, that's the one I read at the Gross Out in Atlanta where I first met you, where we roomed together with yep. Mike Oliveri. Yep. And Dave Barnett approached, he said, you know, we should put that in a book. And originally another press was going to do it and got Lee involved, and then they weren't able to do it, so Dave took it, and that's when it came out through Necro. But yeah, there was like a go between who got Lee involved with it, and he did his story, The Dritophilist, for it, the one he's still ashamed of. <laughs> I mean, I, I know the answer because I remember that time very well, but were, were you nervous? Did you have second thoughts like, what, what the hell? I can't get up there and read this gross out story. I, I can't get published with Necro Publications. I would say I'm actually more nervous about doing readings now than I was then, and I'm not sure why, but it's really? just kind of it's just kind of worked out that way. Is it because you're older and you're more sensitive to the the sensibilities of the audience? You think maybe? No. I'm not. <laughs> Not, not especially, but I guess there was such a long drought between doing it that I had to, I don't know. I used to read my work in uh, class in high school, so I had a little familiarity with it before I went to the convention and did right. it there. And I just kind of assumed, yeah, everybody's going to really like this, and they did. And that wasn't always the case afterward. But right. Well, let's, let's talk about that drought, because, you know, at, at the time, you were also recording music. Um, I know you had some, what you told me in private were some disappointingly attended shows, mm-hmm. um, and then you're also getting the not everybody likes what you wrote. Right. So around, you know, to the mind of a horror reader, you kind of disappeared around 2003, 2004. Yeah, uh, I had that story for In Layman's Terms, but of course, In Layman's yeah. Terms kept getting pushed back. It took a decade to come it took out. ten years to come out. And I was still writing in that time, I just didn't really publish anything. So yeah. it seemed like I vanished, even though I was still writing all that time. I was actually collaborating with the, the co-author of Reincarnage during that time. We've been writing together that long. Right. Oh, so that book took that long. It wasn't do. that one. We, yeah. We had a, there was one book that we did first that took a few years that was really long and hasn't come out. Maybe it will someday. Right. And we started a second one too, and then this reincarnage was like the third one that we'd actually done together. You know, you've you've collaborated with Lee, mm-hmm. collaborated with Jason, uh, you know, Matt Shaw, uh, all of us together on sixty five Stirrup Iron Road. Do you prefer collaboration or do you prefer solo? Because I mean, to a casual reader, it would look like Ryan likes prefers to have another writer on board. But. Yeah, I just keep getting involved with them somehow. <laughs> uh, Reincarnage was just supposed to be a novella, yeah. really, and it was just supposed to be a quick one-off project, and then it wound up being almost 100,000 words. So I'll, I'll get involved with these collaborations, and then they go on longer than I expect, and I keep back burning any solo work. So in some ways, it's better because it keeps me more motivated. Right. But um, 
with solos, it's it's nice to be able to call all the shots too. Yeah. Now, what about header three? Because you, you mentioned you and Jason were working on a lot of stuff at that time. I know when you collaborate, every collaboration is different. Every process is different. Mm -hmm. How do you switch from Jason to then work with Lee on header three? Well, Lee had written header three as a script for the guys who uh, adapted header into a film. And, you know, he'd written the, come up with the whole script and described how the shots could be done where, you know, everybody wouldn't be arrested if they actually filmed it. <laughs> <laughs> And he'd done up to a certain point, like two-thirds of the book, and all I had to do was basically adapt the last third of his screenplay to, you know, the book. And just right. where he tried to minimize the details, I expanded them greatly Yeah, <laughs> with the, uh, you know, the atrocities. So Was that fun? Do you think I have to one-up Edward Lee when you're doing that? <laughs> well, since he, you know, already built the those atrocities in, I was just basically adapting what he came up with right so um yeah i just tried to make it good and i tried to tailor it a little more to his style than mine so it seemed like more of a seamless transition i thought it i thought it was very seamless um i i thought you you did a lot more on it than apparently you did i mean you know i i thought you guys went the whole way through together no because it, it is it is seamless you know when you I mean, you, you collaborate as a musician, obviously, when you're in a band. It's yes. a collaboration. You collaborate as a writer. What do you think is the key to sex, successfully collaborating with someone? Because um, artists are temperamental motherfuckers, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I've been doing collaborations long enough that I'm probably a little easier for me to compromise on those sorts of things than maybe somebody who's just uh, coming into it without that kind of background like Brian Smith. Stir Up Iron Road was the first time he'd ever written with anybody else. Right. And now he was nervous about it, too, you mm -hmm. know. But and apparently, I mean, he liked it enough that afterward, you know, he said, you know, you and I should try to write something together. Yeah. So, What did you think of Stir Up Iron Road? I know we've talked on the, on the show, and I know uh, Lee and I did a panel somewhere where we talked about, you know, <laughs> it, it started out. A collaboration and then somewhere along the line everybody starts trying to one-up each other and Dallas sends me this email where he says I don't want to do this we've lost the plot and I said hey listen man you can't back out what if we go meta and you have your character tell the reader everything you just told me in this email which was the only way we could keep Dallas on the book well how did you feel about that honestly <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't, I didn't really like the meta angle that the book ultimately became. The last chapter with uh, Wrath and me and Lee was mostly Wrath writing it. I injected a few things, right. but um, I didn't have a lot to do with the meta part. Well, of I know it, it came down to an even split. Nate Southerd and, uh, and Jesus and Dallas all wanted to go for the meta. And you and Rath and Lee really didn't want to. And Shane. And Shane, Shane yeah. Yes. And, and I was I was trying to keep everybody happy. But, <laughs> uh, but so you you and Brian, you're still working on that? That's still in progress? Yes, it's a gradual thing. We each have other things that we yep. do, but when time allows, uh, we'll write a couple chapters or whatever to push the book along. And I mean, it's almost up to 50,000 words already. Good. So it's it's still an ongoing thing, and he's about to add some more stuff to it when he can. And see, Mary, I don't feel so guilty because Brian and I are, are collaborating. And <laughs> it'll be five months before either of us get a chapter yeah. done and send it to the other one. So. Well, you know the Reincarnage sequel? I went almost over a year before I was able to send Reincarnage back to Jason. Yeah. I just kept having deadlines coming up for short stories and other things. And yeah. yeah. So, you know, extreme fiction extreme metal what is it about extremity that attracts you does it go back to that that friday the 13th part seven i mean was that your gateway drug <laughs> i guess i guess it was i mean probably what really warped me altogether. <laughs> i was talking about this with gina yesterday my sister was babysitting and i was over at this house watching a movie with her and the other people who were there and it was a movie where a naked guy was chasing a woman with a knife, and that was his thing. To reduce forensic evidence, he would strip naked, 
and then kill women and sometimes men naked so he wouldn't leave behind as much evidence. And you thought, I want to do this, but I don't. <laughs> I would like to do uh, that for a Obviously, how's, how does one get involved in that kind of career path? But, <laughs> but I kind of thought it was funny, of course, because they were naked. Right. <laughs> and that probably just put some strange ideas in my head from, from that point on. But later I found out it was a Charles Bronson movie. It was called Ten to Midnight. And I eventually caught up to it, you know, several several years ago. And I mean, right. I still, I, I love that movie. It's really good. But um, do, you, do you read stuff or listen to stuff that's not extreme? Like, do you ever sit down with a, a Charles L. Grant book or, uh, <laughs> Thomas you know, I read Thomas the, Ligotti? I read The Pet last month, as a matter of fact. Yeah? yeah. Yes, I, I do read lots of non-extreme stuff. I read... Um, everything Stephen King puts out. Do you much. ever think of trying your hand at it? Or? Uh, it's not out of the question. Yeah. I would do it. The story I did for Matt Shaw's uh, Masters of Horror anthology wasn't wasn't that extreme. That's where I was going with that. Yep. Yeah, okay. I wondered about that. So, do you think, how, I mean, how did, how did your audience react to that? Did I, they? Don't, I haven't heard a lot of feedback about what anybody th thought about that story. Uh, but, I mean, Gina liked it. <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, I had a I had a guy here. I should mention the audience. We're we're recording this at KillerCon. I had a, a very nice young man, Russell, come up to me and tell me he had heard that I was an extreme horror writer like you and Lee. And his first book of mine was Ghost Walk, and he read it and he said, "Well, that wasn't extreme at all." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I wonder sometimes how it is. Like you know, when we've had Lee on the show, we've talked about. Some of the stuff he does is not as extreme, and how how the audience responds to that. I wondered what it was like for you, but yeah, that's there's been such a small sample size right. to, to date for the stuff that isn't really all that extreme. That's um, what my mom said about you too. Small <laughs> sample size. Small sample <laughs> size. <laughs> yeah, um, it seemed like Reincarnage didn't sell as well as Genital Grinder, but I mean, part of that could have been splitting the royalties. But right. um, I, I would have thought. Reincarnage had a wider appeal, though, as a slasher thing, because more people like slashers than just outright extreme horror. Right. I think maybe they just are finding out about it. Several people told me, I didn't even know this existed, and sounded really excited about trying it out now. So, so there you go, listening audience. That's the one you need to go buy after this show. <laughs> um. <laughs> what did you think of Reincarnage? Have you read it yet? I have not read okay. it yet. I've got it on my stack. Okay. But I haven't read it yet. Okay, um, it's the it's the one by you that I haven't read yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll get there. Okay. No, actually, that no, that's not true. I haven't read your collaboration with Matt Shaw either. Okay. So all I know about it is the the portion you read for your reading this weekend, <laughs> so which I liked. Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, we talked about about Deadite, you know, Genital Grinder, Reincarnage. You have fans both among the extreme horror readers and the bizarro readers. Um, what do you consider yourself? I mean, do you consider yourself an extreme horror writer, just a horror writer? I'd say primarily extreme horror writer. Other stuff isn't out of the question, but I haven't really done a lot of it, so for now it's easier to say extreme horror writer. Do you think you would ever do something bizarro? Seeing I've, as how you have a fan base in the, in that camp, I've thought about it. I mean, the day may come when I actually do it. I'll write down ideas from time to time. Right. I mean, there may be a Vaughn and Greg book someday. And, no shit. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I can't see that not being kind of bizarro, just because I'm putting them in college when I do the book. <laughs> <laughs> Coop just wrecked the ambulance <laughs> listening to this right now. Yeah, I, Vaughn I, I, and Greg go to college. Yes, I thought that would be so ridiculous, and <laughs> it would be hilarious. I think trying to, for them trying to relate to a different generation. Well, yeah, that's my. Question. Would you set it on today's modern college campus? Yes, yes, I would. With all the identity politics and I, all I, of that, I, I think that would, yeah lead to some interesting conundrums. Like you need to write, forget about, <laughs> Brian Smith, I love you, but forget about this collaboration with Smith. That'll wait. You need to write this right now. <laughs> write the fuck now. <laughs> it, it will happen someday. I, I add ideas to it every now and then, and it cracks me up anytime I think about it. So, <laughs> All right, well, before we end here, tonight, well, it'll be 
over by the time the listening audience hears it, but you're up for a Splatterpunk Award tonight for Best Novella. Header, header three with, with Lee. Now, you've been doing this as long as I have, man. This is your first shot at, at a serious award. Does that fuck with you? Or, you know, it's it'll be like, all, how the hell did this happen? Yeah, or, it'll be all downhill from here, probably, yeah. but <laughs> it's wild. I mean, is it, is it kind of cool, though? Is it kind of, you know? To be, yes, to be part of the first, the first one, it, it's yes. really, all, it is great. And um, I am, remember, it were, it was readers who put you on the ballot. You know, all the, all the jury, the, the jury looks at who got the most nominations and say, okay, these were the top in each group. And then if they feel there's a work that was missed, the jury can add it to the ballot. Um, they didn't have to do that this year. It was, luckily, it was, the readers were really good. But it was readers who put you there. So do you have something to say to those readers? Oh, I appreciate anybody who puts themselves through the kind of stuff I write about. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's always thrilling to meet people and hear them say how much you know, they enjoy the work and that they're fans of it. I mean, when you first told me that Jeff wanted to do a, just a book with me. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I owe that to you for, t you know, saying, yeah, I have his contact. I'll give it give it to you to get in contact with him. And yep, he, uh, whatever happened, he, he <laughs> wanted to know, whatever happened to Jeff Cooper and whatever <laughs> happened to Ryan Harding? And I said, well, Coop's, Coop's driving around in an ambulance. He's not writing much. And I said, but, you know, I can put you in touch with Ryan. He'll do something for you. Yeah, you know, I think you told me, so yeah, Jeff said that he was a fan of your work, and I was thinking, a what of my what? <laughs> <laughs> but he was. I wasn't bullshitting you. No. So, and he managed to get a book out of Coop, too. I don't yeah, know how that happened. That's amazing. So. That is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Ryan Harding, thank you so much. Uh, folks, go out. Reincarnage. That's the one you should buy. Let's get the royalties up on that one. <laughs> yes, please. All right, Dave, we're coming back to you in the studio. All right, so there you have it. One more time, uh, thanks to Liam Shardlow, the new novel, Fell Beauties, uh, in the last outpost of ugliness in the world. Beautiful people are falling from the sky. The beautiful people, the beautiful people. Da -da -da, the beautiful people. should have played that at the beginning of the show. We today. should have. We should have I played that at the beginning of the show today. Oh, well. Now, see, this is, this is why we only have 400,000 downloads a year. <laughs> or, or six. <laughs> Depends yeah. which, do you go by the download numbers or the haranga numbers? Because yeah. <laughs> there's like two vastly different scales there. You know, you know Jack, how more people will listen to the show, special Shirley Jackson Award. When uh -huh. when fat Haringa is kicked out of the buffet, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> where he is holed up for food and safety. No, the character's name is Fat Janet. She is forced to confront not only the reality of perfect falling bodies, but the attentions of an overzealous plastic surgeon and his followers. She teams up with a mystery man to get out alive, but soon finds that confronting the problems <laughs> head-on is the only option. Fell Beauties by Liam Shardlow from the New Bizarro Author Series, available right now on Amazon.com in both ebook and paperback. We thank Liam for sponsoring this week's show. Hey! Uh, Bless you. If you'd like to... Listen to me belch in the microphone. No, <laughs> wow, if, if you'd like to sponsor the show, that's easy to do. You yes, can send is. Dave an email. His email address is meteornotes at gmail.com. That's meteor, like the giant rock from the sky. Notes, like what I'm reading from right here, at gmail.com. I want to remind folks uh, about the Horror Show Book Club. Every other month, we, we read a book together, and then we talk about it on the show. That's when Professor San Giovanni really shines. <laughs> um, our this, next yeah. one is next week, and that is I Am Providence by Nick Mamatas. There's still time for you to read it if you hadn't. Uh, in November, we will be talking about The Ceremonies by Ted Klein, a modern cosmic horror masterpiece. If you are a Benson and Moorhead fan, mm -hmm. you'll be a fan of, of oh, The yeah, Ceremonies. Absolutely. Um, also want to remind folks that if you enjoy this show, you might enjoy our sister podcasts. We have Defenders Dialogue with myself and Christopher Golden. We have the aforementioned Cosmic Shenanigans with Professor San Giovanni. Um, those are both available wherever you listen to the horror show. Uh, they're made available by our network, the Project Entertainment Network. If you could support them on Patreon, that would ensure that you will continue to enjoy these shows for free. Uh, of course, we also want to mention that if you just can't get enough of Dave... And who can? <laughs> <laughs> you, 
You can watch him, not just listen That's to right. him. You can watch him All most of my nights. My bearded glory. Uh, oh. He's he's at twitch.tv <laughs> slash meteor notes. That's twitch.tv slash meteor notes. And of course, Brian Keene Radio playing free 24 hours a day, seven days a week, run by a little AI I call Ultron. Right now, Ultron. <laughs> of course. Right now, Ultron is playing Blind in Texas by Wasp. Um, the way oh, Brian like Keene Radio works, yeah. you go to BrianKeene.com, click the Brian Keene Radio tab, and there's all kinds of options there for you to listen from your iPhone or your computer or your car. Um, basically, every morning at 6 o'clock, I come out and I'm live and I give you the news before I've even had a cup of coffee. And then after that, Ultron plays music all day long. Why does he play music all day long? Because I enjoy writing to music. So Ultron is in pure music mode all day. What you're listening to while you're at work on Brian King Radio is exactly what I'm listening to while I'm working. Okay? So then, you're watching, you're listening to the magic happen. That's right. Then, 6 o'clock at night, I'm back to give you the news from the day. I'm a little more caffeinated at that point. And then, all night long, we play a mix of music and the best of the horror show with Brian Keene, Defenders Dialogue, Cosmic Shenanigans, John Urban Six Ink Stains, and all kinds of other stuff. How do we do this? How? Ultron. Dun, da, da, da. And a reminder that every musician, every artist that we play is getting a royalty for that uh, because we do it via Spotify. So Spotify, we're honest Spotify, pirates. Because <laughs> we are honest pirates. <laughs> we're the only honest pirate radio station in the world. Yeah. So, yes, there's all that going on. Um, Quickly, I just want to mention, uh, we talked about it before a couple weeks ago, and people have asked me about this, so I'm going to clarify in the air. We talked about raising our ad rates. We're not going to do that until sometime next year. So uh, right. just to clarify that. And we have open inventory uh, for the rest of the year, unlike the first half of the year when you guys all wanted to buy ads and there was no inventory open. We have some spots open now. Uh, so contact me. So now's a good time. Now's a good time to advertise, especially if you want to buy more than one ad. We will make deals. So we like deals. Yeah, I like deals. deals. Are good. I like ad sales because I like groceries. And groceries uh, are also good. paying my car registration. The uh, <laughs> David Bryan, the author who bought the ads for Strange Case at Misty Ridge, okay. um, you know, ran them on this show, mm -hmm. ran them on Cosmic Shenanigans, ran them on Defenders, uh, Dialogue, right, 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 right. and ran them at different times. Mm -hmm. He's a dream advertiser because mm -hmm. he gave me his data for sales. Oh. Mary, yes, an ad on Cosmic Shenanigans, yes, sold thirteen copies of his book. Wow. That's really good. Over like a I shouldn't the, sound so over, surprised. Oh, no. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> An yeah. ad on my show will sell copies. So, yeah. Uh, can so I, can I see that data then? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, it's an email. I, I, Actually, I thought he CC'd you on it. Maybe no, he didn't. No, I didn't. Sometimes people talk. I When I said, like, when I was scared as a carriage, definitely I did this. I tried to talk to every person that I remember who bought an ad on the show uh -huh. to see how they did. And like I said, you know, I'm not going to ever give out numbers in the air because I think that's proprietary where people sell their own books. If right. they want to talk about it, that's fine. I'm not going to do that. But everybody I talked to was like, oh, no. A lot of people said, especially people who bought like multiple Holy ads. shit. What? Look at that. I don't want to Is that a cricket? Because I've been hearing crickets That's a cricket. All... That is a cricket. See, folks, this is yeah. why you always listen after yeah. the last ad. Exactly. The show just went into overtime. Yeah. Look the... at him. I know. I was waiting what for- What if I can get him to chirp into the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He's chirping so loud. I'm surprised people can't hear it at home. Yeah, he's not. Well, that's not him. That's chirping, not him chirping. Though. Those are the bugs outside. outside. No, no, no. But no, there was before, one back there chirping. One back, it might have yeah, been like behind your computer when we were doing that horrible story. Yeah, he was chirping right. like he was. So anyway, look, the, I can't have you in here, dude. The, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. So the, my my what I was saying was. Uh, no, I'll go back there. <laughs> Brian's rescuing guys, wildlife. Like, at the <laughs> I know you don't want to miss this. It's a good name badly because it's not a cricket. It's it's the predator. Right. <laughs> I've got him in my hand. See, Don't I, come there. I already came that. up with a better idea than using that new Predator movie. You give him a kiss? No. <laughs> no. Hey, here, you are. Hold on. I'll put him on your shoulder. If you ever want to get laid again, you will just put that thing outside <laughs> where it belongs. <laughs> See how quickly you move that. <laughs> I have strong feelings. I'm yeah. sorry. I have opinions. Yeah. So. You see how quickly I got rid of that. I, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I heard that threat because I occasionally hear that threat too for different things. And you'd be amazed how quickly I do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sex works, people. But uh, what also works is advertising in the show because people who have bought multiple ads have told me that uh, it gets their name out there. Yes. They might, they'll see a yes. slight sales bump, but then they'll hear from people you know, months down the road because, you know, people listen to our back catalog. It gets played on Brian Keen Radio. And people say, oh, I remember hearing your name on the horror show, and I, I looked you up on Amazon about your book, or they come to a convention and say, oh, I heard about you on the horror show, they'll buy the book there. Right. So it, right. They, these ads really do work. And like I said, the fact that our, we have a really busy back catalog, and we, unlike other podcasts, do not take the ads out of the show. Once you buy an ad, it's right. in that show it's in forever. There. 
Uh, same with Cosmic Shenanigans. I mm-hmm. can't speak for any other podcast I don't work on, but I think they do the same thing. You get your name out there, it stays out there. It's the gift so, that keeps on it giving. It is. It is the gift that keeps on giving. So please, 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 we have open inventory. I would like to sell out for the rest of the year. I would like to pay my bills. So yes. thank you. And I would appreciate ads on Cosmic Shenanigans, too. Yeah. So uh, and, and now a song. And now a song brought it to you by could be Brian King. The Cricket Song. The Cricket Song. <laughs> By an ad on the horn show. <laughs> it's the way to go. <laughs> Mary said if Brian didn't release the cricket, he could no longer lick it. <laughs> or stick it. <laughs> See you next week, folks. Bye. 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 This is Jim Adams from Monster Attack. Hey, if you remember that monster movie from your childhood that got it all started for you, the one that really got you interested in monster movies, horror movies, sci-fis, and cult films, then you're going to want to listen every week to Monster Attack. We look at some of our favorite monster movies from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. With new episodes uploaded every Monday, it's Monster Attack. Exclusively on the Project Entertainment Network.